Camping on medieval events and festivals is one of the many reasons why this hobby is so awesome and why I have been active for over 10 years now. So and hello there, my name is Andrew, I'm from the Shieldery and I've got three medieval events on the next three weekends, which gives me the perfect opportunity to show you as many awesome aspects as possible. They open up to public on Friday, which means you gotta set up the camp on Thursday, today's Wednesday and that means it's time for the wrap up. The first event I'm gonna drive to is in Hautzenberg and as you can see the meteorological situation isn't ideal by any means. So I hope I'm gonna be able to drive to the point where I can set up my tent as close as possible because sometimes it just gets too muddy and then the cars would just sink into the ground, which I hope won't be the case here. In addition, the people which I'm gonna camp with, I know them since like four years and I'm looking forward to seeing them again. There's a reason why I bought like 20 liters of beer. <laughs> My tent is a so-called Saxon tent, but with the opening not in the middle, but on the side. That's why it's also called a merchant's tent, because you could put an extra piece of medieval tarp on the side and create a not visible space. By that, you got a public part for things to sell and a private one. I'll let it open though and just cover up my bed with some medieval looking blankets. To be honest, I planned like so many awesome shots to show you how nice it is to see all those people I haven't seen for like years again. But now it suddenly is three hours past midnight and I think that just proves my point quite good. Which means I'm gonna go to bed now. See you tomorrow for further details. <laughs> I got quite a hangover, but I think that's reasonable at this point. In addition, it smelled very strange when I woke up. If you look at the floor, the torch burned through the wood and then through that and yeah, well, basically through everything. This will cost me like 60 bucks, but it's okay. I got no idea how this happened though. Maybe it's because the grain texture goes towards me, like in the other and not usual direction. Be it as it is, I guess I'm gonna make some coffee now, then I'm gonna clean up the tent in order for it to look authentic. Then I'm gonna go around and see who else I recognize. I really need a coffee now. I just love the atmosphere of those events so much. You got visitors who just want to relax a bit after work or have a nice time with the families. You also got your colleagues with which you can talk about medieval times and what part of the clothing they still didn't finish over the winter break. You got a non-stop laugh about stuff and have cultural exchange by trying the beers which they bring to the medieval event. A thing I feel obligated to talk about now is the sanitary situation. On most events you have to use the same toilets and sinks as the visitors to wash your face and brush your teeth at night. Showers are also only available on one of of three one out of four events the first two events take place on long weekends with a holiday day on monday or thursday which means it will take place longer if you can't take a shower over four days and nights it gets smelly especially in the summer so that's like the biggest unexpected minus point for starters you usually don't think about before it happens in my opinion i swear i wanted to go to bed early this night but when i got up at midnight i noticed a strange glow on the horizon at first we thought that it must be lights of the next city but it suddenly changed color unfortunately my camera couldn't catch what followed next so here are the beautiful pictures we took. And it was 3 a.m. again. I put a big log under the corona candle this time, but just to be sure, I also put one of the fire bowls underneath. Good night. Yes, it worked as it should. Only like five millimeters are burned off off the log. Let's dive deeper into the structure of the German medieval scene slash events now. We mainly differentiate between three kinds of participants. First are the performers or craftsmen on location, which means musicians, fighters, bronze casters and so on. Second, merchants, which sell basically everything from fruit to drinks over real authentic stuff to cheap wooden swords and shields for children. And third, camping groups with a majority of tents and people on most events. Mixtures between those often happen. For example, some groups make a flea market in front of the camp's entrance or they got a performer who makes chain mail for the visitors to see. Let's take a closer look to the normal starting point of most people which is the medieval camping. People are usually camping together in groups and in those groups you got open tents for visitors to look into with medieval styled or historically correct interior. But we also got closed ones which isn't wrong and especially for families with little children normal and understandable as you can see here. Then we also usually got a medieval sun sail for the group with tables and chairs to sit underneath. A tent for the food and drinks is also common for the group 
group as a whole. All of that will be difficult for me to manage on the next event because I'm gonna do that all by myself. What's special about this event in contrary to the other ones is that we actually got a medieval thingy here and of course a very beautiful view. Come closer. I've never been that much into cooking on vacation, well, or cooking at all. But after binging Delicious Into Dungeon, the anime, like two times, I want to give it another try. So let's make the goulash my father always made for me and my siblings, which I like a lot. And it's also very German because it's with sauerkraut. Let's start with the onions. The main spices we're going to use are salt, pepper, paprika and garlic. And some Gemüsebrühe, as we say in Germany. And I think that's beautiful. <laughs> What I also got to mention is that on German medieval events no roleplay usually happens. No one will ever say to you something like a hilk? That's a very strange glowing rectangular objects you got in your hands. We didn't have those in 1415 or bullshit like that. Even like a Robin Hood impersonator wouldn't give you a Yuck, have you seen the Sheriff of Nottingham? He stole the last penny of Little John's grandma. He'll most likely say something like Hey, fun fact, did you know that Prince John had to tax the British people so hard in order to get the ransom for his brother King Richard? And even that will only happen if you ask him about that specifically. Otherwise, he'll probably argue about which movie adaptation is the most funny one and laugh about Hollywood's imagination about medieval clothing. Mmm. Fucking hell, that's perfect. By the way, thanks to all my Patreons, I'm gonna just blend them in around me now. If you wanna join them, the link is in the description and you can get the recipe for that for free. I'm just afraid it doesn't look that good as it would have been in Delicious Dungeon, but well. I'm way too lazy to just wash an extra plate. I'm just gonna eat it out of the pot. See you in a few minutes, it's just so delicious. I just came back from drinking with the neighbors and gotta tell you about a very important topic which is the difference between long and short term problems. Now we got some short term problems here because as you can see water is dripping through the ceiling here. I could solve that with two principles. The first one is to prevent the water that is dropping down and the second one is to remove what is underneath which I don't want to get wet. I of course could remove the table here and try to move it around but I think I could also use my second halberd to just push that fold upwards in order for the water to escape further down and not directly from the top. What I told you before is the difference between long and short term problems. Well, those are all just short term problems because the long term problem would be to get the tent dry after I'd have to pack it into my car. But we still got like two days of camp left. That means we've got like over 48 hours for like everything to get dry again. And I know this is not like on a German medieval event, but very international. But my main point here is to don't panic. It rained hard, but only for a few hours. When I woke up, I made some nice scrambled eggs with onions and paprika. Over the day, I showed the tourists how to make fire, sold some things, answered some questions and generally had a lot of fun. Rain was also predicted over this night, so I put the table and the weapon rack further into the tent, cause now I can put the tent poles on the edges way lower and make sure that no puddles form on the top of the tent. Luckily, I got everything dry overnight, so let's go to the next event. 
Now, before talking about the armor behind me, I want to answer some of the most often asked questions. The first one is, no, it doesn't feel like being an animal in a zoo when camping on one of those events. Because yes, you're kind of behind a barrier and people keep walking by and looking at you, but you're like uh, answering questions, showing them what you made yourself, what you're doing, and that's like basically every time in the entertainment industry that it's like this way. For example, right now I'm in front of the camera and you are sitting behind your screens. It's also kind of that you are clicking by and I'm standing here, but I still do it and you still watch, I hope, and it doesn't feel like an animal in a zoo at all. It's just like sharing what you love, what you like with other people who like to stroll by. The second question is, isn't all of this quite expensive? Yes, it is. But like every hobby you get into more professional, you got to invest some money. For example, skiing. What does a pair of really good skis cost? Or playing soccer, like a proper soccer shoe and outfit. It's also quite expensive if you want to do it professional. The third thing I want to say is that something like that, like this setup market would never have happened in the medieval ages like that. Never forget it. It's just like a lot of things thrown together in order to get like a yeah well kind of deeper understanding about the whole surrounding and process but like this actually would never have happened. Ah, take a look how late it is. It's time for fighting. <laughs> you know, there are basically like four different groups. The first one is uh, like show fight where everything is choreographed. The second one is uh, a special ruling set called like Codex Belly or Wotan or stuff like that. There you gotta go down when you have been hit three times, I think and you're only allowed to hit in special areas. Then of course you've got something like Kima or, or I don't know how it's called exactly in English. Basically you're only using the moves and techniques which you can see in the old Talhofer manuscripts and Maya and so on. There is also Bohurt which I'm gonna show you now. It's a matter of taste in which you are interested the most and how much is historical correct in which context is an entirely different topic. Bohurt however was never used in an actual battle and is more like inspired by a special tournament form which is called Golden Tony or Bohurt also. But it never was like that in battle. I'll use this opportunity now to debunk some of the most common misconceptions about medieval armor. Yes, it's heavy, my weight's approximately 35 kg, but because it's fitted in pieces on my whole body, you get used to it faster than you probably think. They usually were made to measure, and because of that, you don't lose much flexibility. Of course, there are exceptions, but for most of medieval armor, this is correct. You also can dress yourself mostly by yourself and don't need any help for 95% of the process. But on some parts, a helping hand can save you minutes. The next strap is a modern safety regulation for the sport Bohurt, by the way. As you can see, it's a team sport and you usually fight 5 versus 5 with 3 substitutes. But in larger events like the World Cup, you even get up to 30 versus 30. I didn't go into training for way too long and I'm most probably gonna get my ass kicked quite often. Here are the most important rules. You are not allowed to sting or hit unarmed body parts intentionally, but because the required armor is so good, you can basically hit everywhere. Strikes, throws, tackles and so on are all allowed and if you touch the ground with 3 points, you're out and gotta stay on the ground to the match is over. This can be done when an enemy pushes you down in some way or when you choose to go down because you can't take the next strike from the two meter large Czechoslovak's hellboard in your back. Either way, you win by bringing the whole enemy's team to the ground. Yes! My team made the third place. As you probably already know, I made most of the stuff or like a lot of things you saw in this video by myself. Check one of those tutorials out. See you then. Bye bye. I'm so creative today.